fascinating that um, the quarterly does jump forward quite a bit. I don't know if you noticed that. Last week we were in chapter 10, and this week it has jumped to chapter 15. So before we get started, though, it's always important that we do our preparation. That you, what, is something wrong with the sound? Okay. The preparation, and that is that we uh, do rebound. You get yourself in fellowship with the Lord before we start. That's a private priesthood kind of thing. You confess your sins before the Father. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And then also you be filled with the Spirit. It's a commandment. He's commanding you to be filled with spirit. That means you've got an active part. And then he tells us to focus on scriptures. Shut it, you know, we are to study to show ourselves approved. And so because of that, we always take a moment to let you check yourself. Are you in fellowship with the Father? And if you are, you're ready to learn. If you're not, confess it, and then you're ready to learn. It's that simple. And I find it interesting that Christians make a big deal out of the rebound, out of the repentance. When actually... The better you get at it, the faster you are with it, the better you stay in the fellowship and in filling with the Spirit. So that's the job here, is to stay constantly filled with the Spirit. So, all right, so we're in Luke chapter 15, and the quarterly starts at verse 20. I'm going to start a little bit earlier, because the quarterly starts with the, the father and the elder son talking. And I think that we need to get a full background before we get into the quarterly. And so that's the nature of how I teach. And the first thing is recognize this is the 36th parable that's in Luke. There's 30, we've already had 35 parables. If you've been reading through Luke, there are 35 parables already. And this is number 36. And the purpose of the parable is to illustrate the difference between uh, the concern of God versus the murmuring of the Pharisees over salvation of the lost soul. So if you were in, if you turn to chapter 15, there are two parables in front of the one we're going to talk about. But all of them, in chapter 15, verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes started grumbling, murmuring. So this is, this is going to be Jesus' reply to their murmuring. I don't know if you know this, but in the Old Testament, murmuring, those who murmured against Moses, they were killed. They died. The ground opened up and swallowed them all. Okay? Murmuring against those who are bringing God's message is not a good idea. Alright? So, uh, let's talk about this parable a little bit before we get into actually reading it. First of all, the, the parable is often called the parable of the prodigal son. That's how probably most of you know it. You guys know it as the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. And what does your Bible mark it as? The prodigal son. The son who left home. The son who what? Left home. Left home. Okay. So what I think is interesting about this is that word prodigal. What does it mean? So we have any answers? What's prodigal? The only time I ever hear that word is in relationship to this story. Okay? (laughs) I don't, I mean, you know, I'm a college-educated person, and I never hear anybody use that word except for this story. Oh, this is a different word. (laughs) They have the same root, but it's a different word. This particular word, though, what do you think about it? What does it mean to you? A a wayward, okay. Returning, Returning, not quite. But because the story he returns, we call, you know, we think along that line. But no, prodigal is not returning. Prodigal is wayward or something else. See see how we all have this impression, it's all about turning? But actually, this prodigal word from the Oxford Dictionary says, spending money or resources freely and recklessly wastefully extravagant. The prodigal son wasted all of his inheritance. All right? So notice how our our image, though, has been because we know the Bible story and the focus of the story is the returning part. We don't always get this part. 
A prodigal son in this story is the wasteful, reckless son. However, in the parable, the father is mentioned 12 times. So maybe the story might better be called the parable of the searching father. You know, parable searching father. But check this out. The second definition of prodigal from Oxford Dictionary is having or giving something on a lavish scale. So maybe it's the prodigal father. See? Interesting how, you know, the, the play of the words. The prodigal son was wasteful, reckless spending. The prodigal father is going to lavish his love and gifts upon the son. So we have two different images here as we start to study this story. It's really fascinating. And um, the fact that we don't really understand the, the prodigal. All right, so we're going to get into it. We're going to start with verse 11 in chapter 15. And uh, Jesus is now telling the story. And then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. That's his inheritance. So he, the father, divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Yeah. So we're going to break that apart. Notice, first of all, a certain man had two sons. It's not the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of both sons. Both sons are critical to the story. But let's ask ourselves a question. Why is Jesus giving out this parable? He's already given two parables. And one was uh, a sheep out of 100 is missing. That's one out of 100. 99, okay? Okay. And then the second parable is a woman who's got 10 coins and one's missing. So it's one out of 10 now. So we got one out of 100, then we got one out of 10, and now he's telling the story, one out of two. Two sons. But what's he telling the story for? What do you think? Why is he telling the story now about the prodigal son? Who's the audience? The Pharisees are the audience. And also some sinners who are there too, who want to hear it. But the Pharisee, he's, he's answering the murmuring that the Pharisees didn't like how Jesus was teaching God loves the sinner. They didn't like that. So Jesus is now answering them with a parable. He had a certain, a certain man with sons. This parable is about two sons, not just the lost son. And he said, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. The portion of goods. What do your Bible say? Does it say portion of goods? The share that belongs to me? The share of the estate that belongs to me. My portion of the estate that belongs to me. Um, this is actually quite shocking. This is... In Middle Eastern culture, this is like the worst thing that you can say to your father when he's still alive. I want my inheritance. Now, could you imagine, picture that in your head. If you went to your parents, to a father, and you said, Dad, I can't stand it anymore. I want my inheritance now. What would that be like? What do you think the father would feel like? Well, in this case, this father is extremely wealthy. Yeah. Well, and in the Middle Eastern culture, what you just now told that father was you wished he was dead. You just now said to the father, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. There's a lot going on in this story that we don't quite get in our culture.
Excellent. So I want to make sure we record that in case it doesn't come across, is that in this culture, the elder son inherits and his job is to take care of the estate and to also give to the other members of the family their portions. But we're going to see here in a little bit what is their portions. But the elder son, his job is to take over. But now they're asking, this, this young son is asking the father to give him his inheritance. That means the, the father's going to have to start selling off all of his cattle. He's got to sell off property. He's got to sell off uh, slaves. I mean, whatever he has there to get the dough, the money, that is what the son is requesting. So it's not a simple effort of just saying, oh, here's some money out of the bank. There's a lot involved in this story, culturally. That's exactly right. We're gonna, since they don't split it in half, but he says, the father says he divided it. That means he violated Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 21, it says that the elders get a double portion. The firstborn gets a double portion. So if there's two of them, what you normally would do, a double portion means I divide up into thirds, and two-thirds goes to the elder, and one-third goes to the younger. That's how you would normally do this in their culture. But the father doesn't do that. The father violates Deuteronomy. He violates the scriptures, and he divides it. <gasps> But he gave, but he gave a divided, which is a, is a splitting in half. Okay, but yeah. So we have different ways of interpreting this: one third or one half. And you know, unfortunately, their firstborn double portion. What do you think the firstborn is going to feel like? He's going to be cheated. Not only that but it's going to show up later in the story. Okay, And sometimes we wonder what happened to the son, the elder son, because he seems like a jerk. Well, just think about it. You have a wealthy family, and now half of that is being given to this kid who is, well, it's, it's not a good situation. And then what does the younger son do? He journeyed to a far country. That means... You know what? I don't. I can't stand it here anymore. I'm leaving. I'm taking my goods and I'm leaving. Not only am I leaving, I'm leaving the country. Because you know what? Being here in Israel, there's a lot of rules. <laughs> a lot of rules. So he actually left Israel and he went to a Gentile nation, a Gentile country. He also went where nobody knew him. Yeah, nobody knows him. And he's coming wealthy. See, he's, he's, he's going to be... Uh, but actually, this is what's happening. He's saying, I don't like you relatives, and I don't want the faith of my childhood. I'm wondering if when he would go back to another country, people would judge him for... Because, you know, if he was at home, they would judge him. Yeah, so if he stayed home, he's definitely right now shamed the whole entire family. Right. He can't stay home. So he's leaving. But he can do what he wants. But he can do whatever he wants now. And so if he goes to a different country, they don't know who he is, and he's wealthy, he can just be like a sheik, you know, in charge of everything. So this story is a powerful cultural story. And in my research, I found out something fascinating. This story in literature is considered one of the best, best examples of an ex exquisite, subtle teaching that is a masterpiece. And we don't normally think of this as a masterpiece, but as I got further into it, I said, wow, there is a lot happening in this little story. And so let's see what else happens. Um, it says he also uh, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Thought you all might enjoy this little picture, the reckless living movie. <laughs> so the word for, west, uh, for wasted is the word that's used for a chaff, uh, chaff that is scattered in the wind. 
So when it says he wasted his money, his living, it's the same as taking that, throwing it up in the air and letting the wind blow it away. You know, it was just... And then, you know, the fact that it says prodigal living, that means reckless living. And I thought that was pretty neat. So let's go on to uh, chapter 15, uh, verse 11 and 16. It says, but when he has spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. Oh, man. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. No one gave him anything to eat. There is so much happening in that. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So... Here's the situation, but it says, but when he has spent all, the word here for spent is the word that means it's got devoured by wild beasts. Have you ever thought about that? If you have wealth and you're not using God's wisdom, it's like the enemy comes along and destroys you in your sin as you are rebelling against God, the wealth is eaten up. Like the locust comes and devours it. And here, it was spent like it was being devoured by wild beasts. It was just wasted. So all that money he had, he could have invested it and become extremely wealthy, but he didn't follow any of the biblical principles about handling your money. And instead, he partied it up. He spent his money. I hear about these football players who make millions, and then when they're done playing, they have nothing left over. I think, how in the world could that happen? Well, it happens this way. The beast devours it. Yeah. And then it says, but it gets worse. And there arose a famine in that land. So, you know, sin and bad decisions lead to opportunities for the enemy to destroy you. And then you stay in that sin, life gets even worse. You thought it was bad already. He already spent everything, had no more money. And now there's a famine. I mean, by this time I'm repenting, but he's not. (laughs) He's not. It says, there was a severe famine, and so this son, he became desperate. And in desperation, people don't think very well. Have you ever been in a situation where the circumstances or even your own bad judgment, I call that self-induced misery? When your self-induced misery occurs and you don't repent, have you ever seen things continue to get worse? And you're wondering, how bad can it get? Well, in this case, it can get so bad that you're starving even though the pigs are eating, which is really weird. But it it goes on and it tells us something powerful. This is what the son did. He joined himself to a Gentile. What's that mean? He sold himself. He, He... A Gentile owned him as if he was a slave. And the word here for joined is a very special word in the Greek. Kalao means he's glued to that person. So people who are in sin become desperate and in desperation they get glued to others that makes it worse. A Gentile, non-believer. He's now committing his life to this person. And that person does something horrible. Takes a Jewish boy. Sends him out to take care of the pigs. In their culture, all throughout Middle East culture, pigs, but for Jews and for Muslim, it represents the worst of the worst. Swine, 
Oh, and, and his job was to feed them. That means he's got to take care of somebody better than he's taking care of himself. Shame. It was shame for a Jewish boy to work for a Gentile, and it was even more dishonorable to care for pigs. He's got double shame. We don't. Let's go back to what happened to Jesus. Because when he was slavery and coming out of slavery, going into slavery, coming out, was that exposed to them on that level? About having to be how they're like, which should be a slave? At this point in time, he has no shoes. And when you have no shoes, you're a slave. So I'm saying to the Pharisees at that time, was that exposed to Jesus? The Pharisees here in this story right now will say he deserves what he got. Okay, the Pharisees listening right now to this story are like, well, and rightly so. But he, broke the he broke the family unit. He broke the Torah. He has gone against all the faith. He's left the country. He's glued himself to a Gentile. And now he's with the pigs. He deserves that. Self-induced misery. So, notice what happened when he's with these pigs. It says, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with what they were eating. But you know what? If he does that, he'll get killed. He's a slave to take care of them, not to eat their food. If he was caught eating their food, he would forfeit his own life. So he's there like, what am I going to do? Well, notice what it says here. The word gladly is a word that means he had intense passion and desire to eat it. To eat what they were eating. Longing, yeah. And I should say intense longing to really give you the, 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 what's behind that word. So what were they eating? They were eating these pods. Carob seeds, pods. So with the pods that the swine ate, some of them say husks. You have husks in your Bible. Um, this pod is from this carob tree. And it was the food that was primarily given to animals, but also humans could consume it. And even today, it's a favorite uh, in the Middle East for uh, people to eat. And I will talk a little bit about that because I did a little bit of research on it. I want to share some of the information about this particular plant. Carob. It's chocolate. Well, it's not chocolate, but it's like a chocolate. So I, this is what I wrote. I got here um, from the same site where I got these photographs. It says here, the seeds from the carob are almost identical in size and weight. Therefore, and the merchants would use it to weigh gold. So in those days, the, the seeds, they would weigh the gold with them because they have the same weight and they're consistent. Also, uh, the word here for this, this uh, particular um, uh, plant, uh, the keratin, is where we get the word carrot for weighing how much gold there is, how much carrot is it. Okay, it's coming out of this pod. Yeah, this is fascinating. Also, in Cyrus, which they think this is the story from Cyrus, although he doesn't mention it. It says a distant land. We don't know where it's at, but Cyrus, this is called the black gold of Cyrus. And up until the 1940s, it was their major uh, crop that they produced, both for animals and for humans. And then we go further and we find out that um, the green part of it, when, it's, when, when these pods are in green, you can pull them off and suck on them. And so a lot of people will suck on them. And then as they turn brown, they mash them up and put them into a drink, carob drink, and like a coffee. And also it has three times more calcium than milk does. And the last thing I have here is that in modern times, many people refer to it as being a healthy food because it's an alternate to chocolate and to coffee. It contains no psychoactive substance and is therefore suitable for hypoallergenic and drug-free substance. 
So a little bit more about that, that uh, particular uh, thing that he was wanting to eat. <laughs> Yeah, and so over the years, they learn later to, to do more with it. Yeah, why they give it to the pigs. Back in those days, they didn't quite have all the science to understand it, you know, and, and we have, in the room here, we do have a couple of food scientists, and they can, you know, potentially do some more research for us. <laughs> I've got to leave you guys alone. <laughs> all right, so this is a fascinating situation. Let's proceed on and see what happens. So verses 17 and 19, or 17 through 19. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I'm perishing with hunger. I know. I will arise. I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's got a plan now. says he came to himself. Notice in front of that, the word but. We always skip these little conjunctions of contrast. We now are going to have a whole different part of the story. Because before, it was one thing, but now something else. And that but is that he came to his own senses now. He realized, oh my gosh, this is, I, I've been wrong. I've sinned. He's actually now starting to do the confession. So the first thing to get, I call it rebound. You guys have learned that now. That's my vocabulary because repent, oftentimes people are crying and doing other things thinking it's repenting. Repent or rebound means change your mind about something and think about the way God thinks about it. So he's now going to think about the way God thinks about it. And the first thing he does is a reality check. He says, I'm in sin. That's the, the beginning of repentance is to recognize that you need it. And the first step in repentance is awakening to your desperate situation. And then he says, And I will arise and I'll go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. Repentance, the changing about, turning back to the father requires action. If there's no action corresponding, then you didn't really genuinely repent. And that's why I want to emphasize that there's an action that takes place. It could be as actionable as in your mind, you're praying, God, forgive me, I've sinned. Or it can be even more actionable where you leave the situation you're in, you turn away from it, and you don't go back. That's what he's going to do now. And notice he doesn't say, I'm going to go home. He says, I'm going to go to my father. So the first act here, 1 John 1, 9, is to confess. Yes? Yes? Yeah, villages are oftentimes designed around that family unit first, and the father's authority is, is uh, recognized. And so in order for a child to return to a village, the father has to be willing to accept the child, and the village will know that or not. And if the father's not willing to accept it, then the village will keep the person away. And so we have a situation here where we're going to see the father not only is willing, the father humiliates himself. <laughs> he doesn't know it himself but he's willing to go to the humiliation of being shamed by the village and by his own family in order to survive this he thinks I'm not going to be accepted back to the family but maybe as a servant as a slave I can at least live because my father takes care of his slaves really well that's the thinking here. This kid's been planning now because he's desperate. And he's thinking, what did we do? He probably grew up with a father that told him, you treat those people with respect, even though they're your servants. 
So he's thinking, I'm going to go back to my father because he treats them with respect, or else this man that I'm glued to is not treating me with any respect at all. See the contrast there. The oldest son will resent it. We'll get to that, and you're right. Because what happened with the older son's inheritance? <laughs> so, well, let's, let's read on now. Uh, yeah, we got some more time. This, we got plenty of time. Wow. All right. So, in verses 20 through 24, it says, And so, the prodigal son, he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And I stopped it right there because there's a lot to talk about. A lot happening here. Okay, so that's an excellent question because if I gave the if I gave the impression he was doing this just to survive, I was wrong in giving that impression. In the original language, he is deeply moved to because of his sin. He's recognized he has sinned, and he needs to go back and confess that to his father, and then be willing to be a servant. But most importantly, the first thing that's on his mind is that he sinned, and he's humbling himself and willing to totally submit to whatever punishment is necessary to get back in right relationship, basically. And knowing that that relationship might be, he has to be a, a slave. He's willing to do that. But most important thing is he wanted to go and confess to his father that he was wrong. And what he did was wrong. And so he arose and he came to his father. Yeah, whatever the consequence is going to be, he's willing to submit to those. He is now, you know, he, he's, a, he's a broken man. He's yep. So he came to his father. He did not go home. He went to his father. And in the mindset of a Middle Eastern person, going home is a term that we would use for the family, but going to the father is a term that means I'm submitting myself to he who has authority over my life. He is now truly repented and, and wanting to go to the Father. And when the Father saw him, he was far away, far off in the distance. How did the Father see him? He was watching for him. Maybe the son didn't go through the village area, but went around and he's coming up over the hill or something and the father's been searching, looking for him, longing for his son to return. And we're going to see that that is really what you know, the heart of the father is. <laughs> well... Now, see, what we've done there is we've changed the story by saying the merchants are the one telling the father, and so now the father is now looking. Where else I think what happened is that no one told the father anything at all. The father sees him way off in the distance and knows by even his gait that that's his son. And he's going to do something that's completely 100% wrong in that society. What's he going to do? He's going to run. That's right. These long robes, okay, first of all, he's of nobility. We know that because in a little bit, we're going to find out what robe they put on the sun. But the robe is long, and you don't run in a dress, okay? <laughs> and you would normally pick it all the way up to hip size so you can run straight, right? Which means he's exposing himself. That's why it was not something a noble man would do in that culture. He's going to expose himself and run, and it's a special kind of running he does too. 
We're going to learn that in, in the words that are used. This is really good. But in the meantime, what is God's attitude to his wayward children? How does God treat wayward children? Is he always looking and searching? He searches to and fro. Is he always longing, wanting his children to come to him? Open arms. So the impression that the Pharisees have is not that. The Pharisees are thinking God is a God of judgment. And they get what you get because you deserved it. They don't see God as the loving, searching father. This parable is tremendous. All right. So it says that the father had compassion. You notice that's the first thing it says. He had compassion. Why did he have compassion? What was going on there? Well, he loves the son, but what would cause the compassion part? See what the son looks like. The son is not wearing the clothes that he left with. He's not wearing shoes. And he's emaciated. Emaciated. That's the word I was trying to think of. Thank you. He has been starving. So I went out and I, I just couldn't bring myself to putting pictures up here of starving people. But I went and looked and I said, oh my gosh. I have never experienced what starving looks like. But the father here saw his son who had been starving and had compassion. And the word here for compassion is, uh, in, in, in the ancient days, the bowels was where the emotions came from. And so the word used here means to have bowels that yearn or to have pity and compassion on somebody. It's a deep, deep emotion. It's not a simplistic, I feel sorry for you. No, it is the father completely broke down. He, he is so yearning to help and to be a part of that boy's life that it says he had compassion before anything else. Jesus uses that same word multiple times when Lazarus died and, the, and his sisters came and wanted him to help and they were crying, he said, it's too late. He had compassion. It says he cried. Jesus cried. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he still had that compassion for what the sisters were going through. We don't always understand that when we read it in our English. But here is that compassion drove him to run. And the word for running is really funny. Uh, treko is a word that means to exert yourself so much in a race that you want to be first. And you're just all out running as fast as you can. That's the word being used here for the father running after the son. It's an all out hard run, a sprint as fast as you can go. And it's a long ways to go because it says far off in the distance. The father ran as if he was running a race to win. It's a powerful story. And it represents how God feels toward us. And then when he got to the son, what did he do? He fell up on his neck. He embraced him and kissed him. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> the son has been with pigs. <laughs> the son is been starving. The son is probably having a hard time just walking the distance. And now the father falls on his neck, kisses him, but the word here is very, very, very special. It means to smother him with kisses over and over and over and over. No stopping. This person's filthy. He's, see, in other words, the father doesn't care the state of the son. The father cares that the son has returned and is now alive. There's a lot happening in this story. 
And this is how our Heavenly Father sees us. He runs after us. He sprints after us. He grabs us, hugs us, and kisses us over and over and over and over without stopping. That's what's happening here. Kata phileo. It is more than just regular love. It is a passion of over, and it's also done in a perfect tense, and therefore it's continuous. It doesn't stop. So the whole time he's kissing them and walking them back, he's still kissing them and walking them back. He didn't kiss them, kiss them, and say, okay, son, come on back. No, the whole time he's walking him, it is the neck being held, the kissing, 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 as he keeps walking them back to the, the farm, the, the estate. Powerful time. So see what else happens. So the father said to the servants, Notice he didn't even say this to the son. He didn't turn and start saying anything to the son yet. I think he's overwhelmed. He can't really say something to the son yet. He turns and he tells the servants, bring out the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand and put sandals on his feet. And at this point is where I get to put my sandals back on. And when my, my uh, high school teacher was teaching this to us. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost and now is found. And so they begin to be merry. Cool part of the story. Wonderful part of the story. Lots of good things are happening here. Bring out the best robe. The word here for robe is that word I was telling you about earlier. The stole. The stole is a particular robe that's only worn by priests, by kings, and by noble. And so he says, bring out that robe, the one that is the special one that we only use for special celebrations. Put that on the boy. <laughs> well, we're going to find out there's enough time between the merrymaking that the kids got time to go get cleaned up. But it doesn't tell us much about that. But as, you know, we can recognize that, okay, the father's going to want him to be clean, going to you know, do all that stuff before he starts putting on you know, the celebration clothes. But I want you to know what the celebration clothes was. It was a special robe. And it says, put on him the ring. And the ring there is a dactylios, and that's a signet ring that the father has for authority. And whenever he buys something on credit, you use the ring to put it into to seal, and so it gave you the power of the family in that ring. You know, when Joseph, yes, we have our signet rings on, my sweetheart and I, had, so that's our wedding bands for us, is our family signet. Well, Joseph, if you're doing the Joseph uh, stories on, on Wednesday nights, Joseph was given a ring by the Pharaoh and given a robe also, nobility and the ring of power. And so that's what also the, the father wants to give to the son. And then he tops it off. Notice the order of sequence here. Gives him a robe, gives him the ring, and now he puts sandals on his feet. Sandals on his feet here is the sign that you are now free. You are no longer a servant. Servants could not wear shoes. They could not have sandals on. And in this case now, you're not only restored in the proper position, but you now have the freedom to make your own choices again. Wow. You mean he could screw up all over again? Yeah, he could. <laughs> he has freedom of will. The Father has restored him to his full, full position. It's a powerful story. And then he tells him, hey, you know what? We're not done. Let's go get that fatted calf. What in the world is that all about? Well, it's, it's a calf for it's a particular purpose, but not for sacrificing. It's a different kind of calf. This calf is, you, you always had a calf prepared, if you were royal, that is, if you were noble and, and wealthy, you had a calf that you fatted with prop, grains and things like that for your special celebrations like weddings. A wedding celebration, which is what this calf is really used for, 
but in this case he's going to use it you know, to celebrate. So it's especially reserved for celebrations, such as a wedding. And also he says, okay, once you get that all cooked up, let us get together and eat and be happy and merrymaking. I just now finished uh, the series of uh, the, the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. And I never read that when I was younger. And so I just finished it. And I'm like, wow. This, it was, it, I really liked that, that, the whole book. But the merrymaking was like, they really enjoyed life. You know, they really, really had fun. And it wasn't you know, a bunch of thieves doing bad things. It was, uh, he was always doing something to right the wrong. Well, let us eat and be merry. And so the father immediately calls for a celebration. He's not going to put it off until the weekend. Okay, this celebration takes place now. Not we're going to wait until after the Sabbath and do it on Sunday. <laughs> do it on the first day of the week. No, he says, we're going to get everybody together now and we're going to celebrate. And uh, we see that. Yes, it's going to be a big celebration. Everybody will be invited because he wants them to know his son is alive. His son is now found. And so... He's taking away that shame. Very good point. So he takes away that shame. And he gets the whole town, village involved and all the family members. And we see that by some special words we're going to find out in a little bit here. This is how we know that it was a big deal because of the words that Luke uses. But, you know, you can tell by me getting excited. But the question is, why a celebration? What does the scripture say? Why are they celebrating? He was lost and now he's found. Prior to that, he was dead and now he's alive. That's their reason. That's the only reason. This, this is powerful. My son was dead and he's alive again. This is, this is an exciting story. So let's see what happens with the elder brother. Now his older son was in the field. Oh, he's out working. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Didn't have to tell him, hey, it's calf number two. He, he knows what the fatted calf is. And so the son says, but... There's that but again. But he was angry and he would not go in. And therefore the father came out and entreated him. Let's see what's going on here. Now his older son was in the field. Who does the older son represent in the parable? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. <laughs> the Pharisees. Because if Jesus had stopped the story... You know, it, it, the, 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 the point being made would not have been recognized by the Pharisees. So there's a little bit more to the story. Who does this represent? The Pharisees. Okay, but it says here he heard, he heard music and dancing. So the music is the word we get for a symphony. Music here is the word for symphony, for a symphonic orchestra, for a concert of instruments. He's not just got a little band. He's got like everybody in the village that can play an instrument, come and play. We're going to have a concert. So this is a big deal. The symphony is going to play. And there was dancing. The dancing, the word used here, karos, is a circular dance and today we know it as the hurrah dance. Have you ever seen Jewish wedding celebrations? The couple in, in, in the middle are dancing with each other and all of the crowds around in big circles, kind of like this. <laughs> this is what's taking place at that celebration right now in this story. The hurrah dance with the symphonic choir. <laughs> This is a big deal. When the Bible says that all heaven rejoices when one person repents and comes to the Father, it's like this. It's a big celebration. <laughs> but the son, he won't forgive. 
So he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. He heard that music, he heard that dancing. What does it mean? Well, the word for ask is a special word. This word is in the imperfect tense, and it means the son kept asking over and over. And, what, what's going on? What's going on? What, what, what's it mean? What's it mean? What, what, what's going on? What's happening? He was urgent, and he was trying to get information. You know, he's the guy that works hard out in the field. He's worked hard for his father for a long, long time. How come he wasn't called into the party? <laughs> Because he was already a part of that party. He just didn't come back yet, you know? But anyways, uh, what happened though? He became angry. He didn't come celebrating and being happy. He came angry. Why? The word here for anger is a particular word that means to be exasperated and to be provoked to anger, to wrath, and refusing to forgive. He kept asking over and over, and every time he asked that question, every time he heard the answer, it, it kept rising up inside of him, this anger that's been building up over all this time, and finally it got to the point where it just exploded. And this anger here in the Greek uh, comes from a, a, a word that we get ogre from, uh, ogre monsters, and this is uh, an anger that is built up over time and then just explodes. It, it, there, we, we can't comprehend the amount of pain this guy felt. But he also didn't come to the Father. But we'll see what happens, though. So, the Father came out to him because he wouldn't go in. Isn't that how God the Father is? Even when we are angry and, we, and we're really upset, it says that he entreated him. Do you guys all have that word in your Bible, entreated? He pleaded with him, entreated him, he pleaded with him. This word, entreated, is the word that we get for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. It's the Greek word for the word entreated. Therefore his father came out and entreated him. It's the word that we get for paraclete. And paraclete means to come alongside of somebody, to console them, and to comfort them, and to be a helper to them. That's what the Father's trying to do now, which is what the word paraclete means for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's the same word. So here's a man who you know, hasn't repented, and he's being called in to repent. Let's see here. So you want to know what, what verse that was? That's what, verse 28? Verse 28 is the... Uh, entreated okay all right so we're going to wrap it up with the last part of it so he answered and said to his father lo these many years i have been serving you i never transgressed your commandment at any time and yet you never gave me a young goat and that i might have made marry with my friends yeah i'm upset <laughs> he called him low <laughs> did you guys get that what did your bible say does your Bible say low? Look. Oh, yeah. The word is look. Uh, in other words, this is a grievous insult to the father. He's addressing his father in an impertinent manner, saying, well, look. You don't talk to your father that way. The father has not even responded in a way that, that a lot of fathers would respond with, I'm going to get mad at you. Stop that. But instead, what does his father do? Well, we'll go on first and let the kid explain himself. The kid says, hey, for many, many years I have been serving you. But, you know, the word here for serving is I have been your slave. Not I have been your son. Not that I was taking care of everything for you because I love you. But I'm your slave is the word he used to his father. I slaved for you. Instead of providing service out of love, which now he's shown his father a lack of love and honor. We'll go a little bit faster here. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me the young goat. That was the other one that was over there for small celebrations. You never gave me the young goat. You know, that, that second reward. That I might make merry with my friends. So in other words, 
you know, Father, how come you didn't celebrate my legalism? <laughs> I've been out working hard for you as a slave. That's the legalist way of approaching the Father. Yeah, that's how it's being interpreted by the, the Pharisees right now, also watching it. He has not been celebrated. And instead, he's complaining. And so, we have, but as soon as the son of yours came, <laughs> the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead, and he's now alive. He was lost and he's found. So what happens here? He says, but this son of yours, he didn't say my brother. He says, that son of yours. <laughs> In other words, he lacks love for that brother, is what's going on. And he came and he devoured everything, all your livelihood with those harlots. Where did he get that? There's been nothing said about any prostitution. You know, now he's making up stories. You know? He's slandering his brother, so now he's just now sinned against his brother also. All right, so how's the father answer that? He says son. He answered it with son. And the word for son is a very unique word in the Greek. It means child. And the father didn't call him son. The, co- the father called him child, which is an act of tenderness and love towards your child. You're always with me, he says, and all that I have is yours. The older son failed to recognize the blessings they already had. And instead of getting angry, the father responds by being gentle and loving. So I got a couple more things I'll quickly go over. We won't talk more about it. I'll let you see it. And if you want copies, I'll make you a copy. So we have the comparison of the two. The younger son compared to the elder son contrasted. And we have some very similar problems in behavior, but how they respond to it is quite different. And then we also have how the elder sons correspond to the Pharisees. So I have a list of these if you like to have those. Because we're out of time. We're greatly out of time. <laughs> All right. And then a couple of questions for you. These are things to think about. Jesus stops the story abruptly right now without telling us what happened to that son, the elder son. And he, you know, did that son repent? Did he come inside and, and go to the party? Precisely the same issue that Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees. We don't know the answer so that we can come up with what we think the answer would be. What should that elder son do? And how should we now respond to anybody else who has, you know, how, how God has blessed sinners, how do we respond to that? Do we respond with celebration or do we respond with, how in the world did God forgive that person? Okay? So that's the point of this story for us today, is how do we respond? Yeah. We're going to be very surprised who's with us in heaven. <laughs> so I got to know that both sons were lost. The first one to immorality in a far country, and the second son, which represents the Pharisees, they were lost in morality to the path of merit. Excellent. I would agree with you. It wasn't original. <laughs> no, but, but it's true. The lost, both children were out of fellowship and lost. And the father's trying to restore them both. Well, one repents and one has yeah. One repents, and the other one, we don't know what happens to him. But the Pharisees have an opportunity to repent, and that's what Jesus is teaching them. Father, thank you very much for your word and for this lesson. I pray, God, that we would be able to apply it directly to our lives, and that we would have the heart of the Father to everybody in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.